URI Academic Health Collaborative in recognition of the inextricable bond between environmental and human health. And we're very pleased to have you all with us here today. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, we are going to be using the Q&A for you to enter any questions that you have. And uh, the ones that seem to have the most predominant um, impact or uh, have several people asking similar things will be combined into one question and, and uh, delivered to our speakers at a later point. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, however, I want to introduce the broader URI community to Elizabeth Roberts, who's the new director of the Academic Health Collaborative uh, here at URI. Uh, which is comprised of health sciences, the colleges of health sciences, pharmacy, and nursing. Rhode Islanders know Elizabeth as a former state senator representing uh, a district of Cranston, Rhode Island, and as the lieutenant governor serving under governors Kachiri and Chafee, as well as the secretary of the executive office of health and human services under governor Raimondo. I've long known her for her public health expertise and look forward to future collaborations focused on the intersection of environmental and public health. When Elizabeth served in public elected office, uh, and she was uh, a very strong voice advocating for public health concerns uh, for the citizens of Rhode Island and is a, an incredible uh, asset to us here at URI. Elizabeth? Thank you so much, Judith. I am delighted to be here today and delighted that we're going to have, delighted might be the wrong word, um, but I'm old enough to remember Love Canal. And as a young adult, it was, I still remember it vividly. And I think about how environmental and health disasters are so inextricably linked. And it's Im so important that the Academic Health Collaborative is, the, is a co-sponsor here as well, where we train uh, pharmacists in environmental toxicology. Uh, we, we train, and I see one of our faculty, Molly Greeny, here today, community health workers to engage the community um, around issues of health and to listen to their concerns and help to respond to them. And where we also, and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our speakers today, um, focus on another really important part of health, which is mental health and something which is severely impacted by um, natural and, and environmental disasters. So it is a, a privilege to be here today and I'm delighted to be part of the URI community. So thank you. Okay, um, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, as a sidebar, we have a super fund research program here at URI in partnership with Harvard University and Silent Spring Institute. Uh, it's under the direction of Dr. Reiner Lohman of the Graduate School of Oceanography. Uh, just a reminder now as I introduce our speakers that you can ask questions uh, using the Q&A function. So 40 years have passed since the crisis at Love Canal, where environmental activist Lois Gibbs led the charge to have over 800 families relocated from a toxic waste dump posing as a suburban haven. Her most notable headline dubbed her transition as that of homemaker to hellraiser. It was the 1980s, let's remember. Gibbs' actions led to the recognition of President Jimmy Carter and the creation of the EPA's Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, better known as Superfund. There are currently some 40,000 Superfund sites across the United States. While the Environmental Protection Agency may be charged to employ Superfund to clean up toxic sites, there are lingering questions regarding the cancer clusters, elevated cases of asthma, and ubiquitous chemical exposure. Uh, one good example, of course, is PFAS, where 98% of Americans, as well as global citizens, carry a body burden of PFAS, which are also better known as forever chemicals. They're carried in their blood. And in addition to that, we have toxins that cause other adverse health impacts related to the life of these sites from discovery to cleanup. Lois Gibbs has dedicated her own life to eliminating the threat of toxic waste and has extensive experience with the evolution and application of government and corporate policies and practices garnered through her work with communities today. 
Lois formed the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, joined by her colleague, Dr. Stephen Lester, a scientist with extensive knowledge of toxic health threats, who first worked with her at Love Canal. She and he will discuss the challenge of providing the protections and remedies essential to American families at risk, and we're extraordinarily appreciative of their timely presentation when we recognize the environmental challenge that's all the more critical in the face of a global pandemic, pandemic when pre-existing conditions are exacerbating everybody's vulnerability to COVID-19. So Lois and Stephen, welcome, and we'll now begin. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Stephen and I have figured out a plan for this. Um, as a scientist and as an activist, we have sort of um, going to sort of give you a, a, a little map of what we're going to do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Love Canal. Uh, it's my backyard, what happened then and how it's actually similar now. Um, and then we're going to talk about, Stephen's going to talk about science and activism and how do those things fit together. If you're a scientist, you want to work with uh, an activist in a, in a site, in a, in a community, what, what does that look like and um, how, 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 do you, how do you handle yourself as a scientist? Um, and um, then after that, we're going to open it up for Q&A. And then we're going to go back and we're going to start talking about CHEJ, which is now going to be 40 years old this coming April, so six months. Um, uh, but the Center for Health, Environment and Justice and, and who comes here and what are they looking for and how we help them and Superfund. Superfund was, I am often called the mother of Superfund. Uh, and just to be clear that um, as the mother of Superfund, I birthed a perfectly healthy child. It was a politicians of all parties um, that tortured my child to, to make it a little bit crippled today. So we are working on fixing that problem as well. But let me, let me begin by explaining, well, Stephen, did you want to say something? I, we didn't really talk about that. <laughs> Um, no, Lois, that was a great introduction. Um, I'm probably going to actually stop my video when you start speaking, so, and then come back on when you're done. Okay, great. So, um, as you can tell, a scientist has all of this stuff behind them, unlike the organizers who doesn't want to mess up their lives with the details. We just want to move it forward, move people. So, I'm going to start with a, with a slideshow, and um, and explain what happened at Love Canal and when it happened. So um, this is Love Canal in 1978. Um, it was an absolutely gorgeous community when I moved in. And no one told me back then that I was living three blocks from a toxic waste site. So on this photo, you'll see to the left where the line is here, this is, this is a roadway, and just to the left of that is the mighty Niagara River. Love Canal is located five miles upstream of Niagara Falls. In the center, you can see where there's a 99th Street School. That was where my child attended kindergarten after I moved in and lived there for a short while. The white dot to on the bottom, to sort of left of center, is where I lived. And when, you, when we looked at this community, when we were buying our home, um, we really thought this was an ideal community. You had the river to yourself. You could go down there, you could actually fish off the banks of the river. You could walk there from my house. You had a lovely school, a fairly new school, the 99th Street Elementary School that was from pre-K uh, to sixth grade. And in those days, uh, the school, when your child went to school, you walked your child to school, you walked your child back home for lunch, you walked your child back to school, and then home at the end of the day. So this community and all of these homes that you see here are homes of young families and the community itself was just bustling with people going back and forth to school, walking their child, big wheelies, moms with buggies. To the top of the screen is, is the part that no one ever talks about. I, I often say to um, universities when I do a lecture, how many of you knew, know of Lois Gibbs before your 
your, your professor or your class and some people will raise their hands uh, and many people will obviously at the end of the day. But I, but I also asked them, how many people know the name Sarah Herbert? So this gets to the environmental justice part. Sarah Herbert lived in the top part of our screen here. This is Griffin Manor. Um, it was a housing, uh, public housing development, little townhouses. You had to have five children to qualify to move in there. They were lovely apartments. People took care of their properties. We went to, their children went to school with our children. We had a one community. We didn't think of it as that side of the track or that side of the town. We were all one. We were friends. We went to the same PTA meetings, the same soccer meetings, everything. Even though we fought side by side to get relocation and <clears throat> they too got relocation as, as we did, no one ever talks about Griffin Manor. No one ever talks about Sarah, who was a beautiful black woman who had five children. No one talks about the struggle that renting families have versus property owners. So this, is, this was our, our, our lovely neighborhood. Um, we had a little Saracenes. We had three, we had three churches. It, it really was a wonderful place to move into. So as a homemaker, I sort of bought the American dream. These are my, my son and my, my daughter, Melissa. Um, no one told me about Love Canal when I moved in, as I said. And then after a short while, I moved in with Michael. Michael was one years old at the time. He was perfectly healthy. And after a few years, Michael got sick. Michael developed all of these problems, a urinary tract disorder, epilepsy, a liver problem, uh, you know, just one thing after the other, severe asthma. I was always taking him to the hospital for, for pneumonia. And, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I looked at, you know, well, first I have to say, um, I looked at my husband and decided that my husband probably was the cause that he had a, B, a bad G DNA, right? That there was some historical thing in his family where his family was very sickly. But after looking at his family, it wasn't him. And it wasn't my family because my family is absolutely perfect. Um, that something else was going on. And I couldn't figure it out. And I asked the pediatrician, and the pediatrician couldn't figure it out. And it wasn't until there was a newspaper in the Niagara Falls Gazette, our local paper, that said that Love Canal was a dump site that was located between 99th and 97th Street, and that it had 20,000 tons of chemicals in it. And that this, this Love Canal dump site and the chemicals associated with it are leaking out. And then they gave a list of the various chemicals and what those chemicals do to people. And I looked at that list, and remember, this is 1978, so most of the studies were not on our children, but rather workers and workplace standards. And so I looked at these chemicals, and I looked at what they said they caused, and I checked off every single one of my son's diseases. Later, my daughter, Melissa, developed a rare blood disease. And all I could think of was, how could that be? How could they build a school in the center of Love Canal? 20,000 tons of chemicals. How can that be? And so the first thing I thought as an individual, as a mom of two, two children, I went to the school board and said, I want my child transferred from the 99th Street School. That this school is dangerous for him. It's built on a toxic waste site. The superintendent said, oh, no, we can't do that. Uh, you have to jump through these hoops, which I jumped through, getting papers from my doctors and so forth. And he still refused to do it by saying, uh, and the last time I spoke with him, anyhow, he said, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Gibbs, we can't do this. Because if we do this for you, then we have to do it for all 407 children who attend that school. And we're not about to do that because of one irate, hysterical housewife. I was blown away. What are you talking about? There's 20,000 tons of chemicals underneath the school. And so what I decided to do was to go door to door, to talk to other parents, to see if they too felt the same way. When I went to Dr. Long, the superintendent's school, I went alone as an individual concerned about my child. And I thought that if we could go as a parent's movement together to Dr. Long's office, that we could uh, succeed at getting the 99th Street School closed. So I went door to door, I talked to people, 
And in my conversations with people, I learned that it wasn't just the small children who were going to the school, that there were men and there were women who were having problems. People showed me their basements that had multicolored chemicals in it. And I realized very quickly that the whole community around Love Canal, so like the first row of homes and the canal in the school, were in danger. And so we got our petition signed and we took the petition to Albany, New York. The city of Niagara Falls and, and uh, the school board were gonna do nothing. So we were asking the health department to intervene and close the 99th Street School. When we arrived in Albany, New York, which is our state capital on August 2nd, we went in to see the health commissioner and with our petition. And as we approached, the secretary said, no, 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 you're not meeting him here. Go down to the auditorium. I'm like, we don't need to go to the auditorium. There's only three of us. We're just bringing our petition. We want him to intervene in the school. No, 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 go down to the auditorium. Well, we went down to the auditorium. And, and this story is important because this is the same story that's happening every single day across the country in Superfund sites, in, in uh, RICRA sites, in explosions, in a number of different situations. We went down to the auditorium only to hear that the New York State Department of Health had declared that Love Canal was an emergency situation. They asked that pregnant women and children under the age of two, they recommended, sorry, that pregnant women and children under the age of two be relocated from Love Canal, that they evacuate. And their reasoning was the blood brain barrier of children, fetuses, under the age of two are vulnerable to chemicals crossing it and affecting their brains. They made this announcement in Albany, New York, 500 miles away from Love Canal. There wasn't a soul at Love Canal to explain to people, what does this mean? How can you put this out there and not have somebody on site to explain what does this mean? So men and women gathered together on 99th Street by the school. This is Patty Grenzi and her young daughter. Patty Grenzi was pregnant. She was in those first rows of homes. What does that mean for my child? What does it mean for the child I'm carrying? And what does that mean for the child who was already born? Has she been damaged in some way? And there was nobody there to answer the question. That was the decision that created the Love Canal Homeowner Association. People gathered in the street and we said, we need to unite, we need to join together. And so we organized ourselves in the fire hall, which was down, down the street. We all got there and met and we tried to figure out what do we want and how are we going to do it? And this is, this is actually kind of a funny slide picture because it says evacuate us all, not just little kids by this little kid. It's like... <laughs> But, but they only said they were going to evacuate pregnant women and children under two. So if you had a three-year-old, you had to stay there. If you had a five-year-old, you had to stay there. So women were thinking about getting pregnant just to get out. It was insane. Um, ultimately, because we, we, we stood together, uh, we created the Homeland Association. We began to speak out. We began to strategize and fight back. Um, after a, a couple of weeks, the New York State Department of Health decided that all 239 families who encircled Love Canal could be evacuated with the state paying their uh, costs to move from that site to another safe site, buying their homes at fair market value and paying for the moving costs. After they did that, they started to do the construction. And um, this is the 99th Street School. This is where they're starting to dig uh, around the, the Love Canal proper. The, the interesting part about this construction, and, and this is another thing that's happening today. This is the thing that makes me the most crazy. If anybody wanted to know how, how crazy can Lois get, she can get really crazy over this issue. They are right there, they are, they are building a, a trench, digging a trench around Love Canal, the proper, to catch any chemicals that run off the canal and move towards the community and then treat it on site. They're putting a clay cap over the top of the dump to keep the rainwater and snow melt from penetrating into the dump site. 40 years, I mean, <laughs> it's now 40 years later, and then we still don't know if that process works. But the thing that makes me crazy is that in 1976, 
two years, because I got involved in 1978, two years before I got involved, 1976, there was a report done by Calspan and Associates. It's a consulting engineering firm out of Buffalo, New York, out by the airport. And Calspan and Associates were asked by New York State to look at Love Canal and to assess both the threat and the cost of fixing the canal if it, in fact, was posing a threat. So in 1976, Kelsman and Associates went out and did this study, and they found that the Love Canal was leaking in 1976, and that it was leaking toxic chemicals into the environment towards the homes, the families, and the school, the playground, and other, and other such exposure sites. They also found that these chemicals were very dangerous to human health and the environment. It was also leaking into the Niagara River, which is a drinking water and, and empties into the Great Lakes. Then in this report, it said, what should we do about it? What are the options for New York State? One option was do nothing, which is the option obviously they chose until 1978. But one option was do nothing. The other option, was to put a clay cap over Love Canal, put a trench around it and a clay cap over it to stop it from migrating out into the community. The last part of the report, which is what they did essentially, the last part of the report was the part that was the decision making. And these decisions are made every single day in this country today in the same fashion. The decision making was a cost benefit analysis. So in 1976 dollars, it was going to cost $20,000 to clean up Love Canal and protect the people, the families who lived around it. And when they looked at the cost, taxpayers' cost of cleaning up Love Canal, then they had to do, that's the cost, who benefits? And they looked at my family and Sarah Herbert's family and how much each household brought in per year. And that is what we were worth. How dare they? They do that today. They're doing it in Houston in Ward 5. They're doing it today in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, around the Superfund site there. They do it every single time they make these decisions. How much are you worth? And that's how we determine whether or not we are going, we, uh, the United States of America, are going to protect you. And they made the decision in 1976, before my children got sick, before... Uh, Barbara Quimby's babies got sick, or Patty Grenzi, the woman you just saw, they made that decision that we were not worth protecting. And they moved on and ignored the situation until today. And they ended up with the exact same plan. They tore down the houses around the canal and they erected a fence. And this fence became our battle cry. This fence is another example of what they still do today. This fence is a political fence. This is a fence that says, if you are inside the fence, as those tractors and those row of homes are, you are at danger. You must be moved. Your children are at risk. You are at risk. If you live outside of the fence, you are perfectly safe. How can that be? These are not force fields. These are political lines. So when you're looking at Superfund sites or RICRA sites or, or PFAS, what level is safe? And safe for who? You come up with the same political decisions. It's based on cost-benefit analysis. Who are we saving? Why are we saving them? Outside the fence in our community, this is down the street from my house, which was three blocks away, they were testing because we forced them to test. They said they weren't going to do anything outside, and we said you have to test. You can't just say there's a the force field here and nothing's going to go beyond. You have to test. And so they agreed, and they finally did some testing. <clears throat> and, of course, they were, as you saw, they were all wearing their little space suits and their respirators and their oxygen. Our children were roller skating and biking and triking and big wheeling down that same street that these folks felt that compelled 
to have to wear those things. So we decided we are also going to do a study. So we did a study at Love Canal, and we did it with Dr. Pagan from Roswell Memorial Institute, who was a researcher and cancer researcher. And we looked at what is happening in our community. So we were assessing the health of the community, and we wanted to know what, what was going on, and we knew reproductive problems were a serious problem. And so, so we looked at our community, and we found that 56% of our children were born with birth defects. 56% of our children had three ears, double rows of teeth, extra fingers, extra toes, or were mentally retarded. We found that most of the people, the children who had birth defects, actually lived in what we call the swale bed, a low-lying area where the chemicals would leak from the love canal and they would sort of pool there, if you will, and volatilize up or, or get into the surface. When we found that, we asked New York State to do the study. We said, look, this is our hypothesis. No, it's not val validated, it's not, but we think something's going on. And what we found was this. And New York State Health Department said it's useless housewife data collected by a bunch of vested interest people. And I have to ask, why is it the victims of harm like this, like Love Canal, why are we the vested interest in, in our data is never any good or our hypotheses not worth testing? But Dow or Exxon or, you know, name your corporate person can come out with all their reports and their studies and somehow it's printed in the Journal of Science and Medical Science and, and there is no huge question about their conflict of interest. But innocent people who are trying to demonstrate we are at risk are, are, are always pointed at like we're, you know, not too bright young people. We, we decided we would fight back, so we did rallies. We did the horror story of the day, which um, included people telling stories uh, about what's going. We demanded that the state does a health study, that they check the, the, what's happening with the children, what's happening with the, the, the health of the people. This is Barbara Quimby. Barbara Quimby has a child, has two children. One of them is severely retarded. Um, the other one has minor birth defects. She wants to know that these things connected. Should she have another baby? It's a, it's a, it's a perfectly sound and, and, and sane question to ask if you're living in that community. So the state decided because of all of the push, because of all of the, the bad media they were getting that they wouldn't do the study um, to do a study. And so they took, you know, um, went door to door, they talked to people, they, they got data out of the database, they collected blood from our small children and our adults alike, and they found the same thing that we found. Um, one of the state health department people called me up and said, well, Ms. Gibbs, you're going to be really, really floored at the meeting tonight. And I'm like, really, why is that? He says, because we found the same thing you found in your study. I'm like, what are you talking about? Of course you did. Like, we didn't make this up. We wouldn't want to make this up. So they had their meeting, and they called the meeting. Uh, this is, this is our, our community. We always turned out 550 people at our community meetings. Uh, so they had their meeting to release their results, and they went on to talk about their scientific study and their, their methodologies and all of this kind of science stuff. And then they said, and in conclusion, what we found was that 56% of the children in this community were born with birth defects, and that the birth defects actually are remarkably the same as the Love Canal Homeowner Association study, including, and then they went on to list them. We all held our breath because we grew up believing that if there was a problem, and it's not our fault, and it's been identified by government, they, whoever they are in, the, in charge, will do the right thing. So we held our breath, waiting for them to say, and as a result, we are going to move you families out of here. But they didn't say that. What they said was, however, we do not believe that that 56% birth defect rate is related to the chemicals in Love Canal. We believe that it is related to a random clustering of genetically defected people. And I can't tell you how crazy people went in this meeting. 
we began to organize even more. Our people were out of control because they just found that 56, over 50% 50 of their babies are being born birth defected and nobody's gonna do anything. They did a lot of protests. They held two hostages uh, temporarily to EPA officials who came to talk to us about uh, chromosome damage, which also was, a, was another thing. So we held them for, for five hours in the homeowner's office. And we held them there because we really wanted to create pressure on President Carter, who was running for re-election. Everything that we learned about Love Canal is it's not about the science, it's about the politics. And so we wanted to put pressure on, on um, President Carter. He was running for a second term. By holding hostages, we got national news coverage. We gave the White House to Wednesday at noon to give us an answer on relocation. And um, this is Wednesday at noon. I, I also would like to just point out that all the media here, we didn't have social media back there. So every time we wanted a news story, we had to go and find it. We had to, we had to get um, all of these different media people and we had to do press releases and it was all paper and it was all phone calls and it was all chasing them down. Um, it's so much easier today. So, so Wednesday, precisely at noon, uh, this is the phone, this is where I called the White House and repeated the White House um, press release to the crowd that you can't really see behind these folks, but it's a crowd of probably 600 people. And at, the, at that um, announcement, the EPA and the White House agreed to move everybody temporarily. Uh, this is May of 1980. They would move everybody temporarily until they could secure the money, but permanent relocation was the goal. And so people celebrated, but the fight was won because of politics. It wasn't won because we were sick, although we were, that we were right, although we were. Um, it was because we organized in a way that they couldn't deny us what we wanted and what we needed. So here's a Carter's order to evacuate Love Canal. And this is what Love Canal looks like today. Um, the canal is gone. Obviously the school is gone. The treatment center you'll see in the center, center left of your screen. Uh, and the pipes are all around the canal and it just sucks the chemicals as they move out into that treatment center. And then after that, um, it's, it's given to Occidental Petroleum, who is actually the polluter here. Uh, it's put in barrels, the, the stuff that's sucked out and treated and taken to Occidental Petroleum for disposal, which is about six miles down, down the road. So, so that's sort of the Love Canal story. And I, um, I really wanna say that it's really about um, politics, not science that we won. And it's politics, not science, that happens across the country that other people are winning. And so with that, now I will give it to Stephen, who's going to talk about science, which is probably a terrible introduction. But, and I apologize, Stephen, but it's all yours. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lois. Uh, thank, thank you all for inviting me to be here. And it's a pleasure for me to be a part of this, uh, this conversation today. Um, Lois, you are a hard act to follow. Um, with a story like that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my involvement at Love Canal. I'm going to tell you a little bit, a couple of stories of my um, education, if you will, uh, and learnings about science and how science fit into some of the things that Lois had already talked to you about. Um, and then um, and then we can open up to q and I'm not going to talk for uh, terribly long. Uh, I do have a few slides. I will see if we can put those up here. Okay, let's see here. Uh, hold on one second. Slideshow, go to slideshow, to the right, to the right, to the right. Oh, too far. Oh, yep. There we go. From the beginning to the left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, with, you know, for lack of a better title, I've come up with science and community activism. Um, so let me tell you a little bit the overview of what I do here at CHEJ. Um, I have two primarily respons primary responsibilities. First is to help people understand the details of this technical information and the science. 
And that involves re reviewing engineering reports, health studies, environmental test results of all kind, and writing up what I generally refer to as letter reports. Um, you know, all the time I talk with people about this information, and then I follow it up with a, a report that lays out what we talked about, what I thought, what I think the strengths and weaknesses are of the information, and, and what it all means. Um, but an equal part of the work that I do is helping people understand where this science and technical information fits into their organizing work. And so it's, it's uh, critically important that people understand that, uh, that, that, that piece of all of this work. So this is just another shot of Love Canal. There's the canal, the, the old landfill is that area right in between, right down the center of the screen here. Um, that's that 99th Street School that Lois talks about, and these are the homes on either side. So what was my role at Love Canal? <clears throat> my role was I was hired by the state of New York to be a science advisor to the residents. Lois mentioned that they had a list of some 15 demands of which relocation was right up at the very top. Well, also on that list, very high up, up, on the, up there somewhere, was to have a science person that they felt they could trust who worked with them. And so I became that person. Um, through a variety of connections with different people involved at Love Canal, I got asked to do this work. Um, and so uh, my primary responsibilities were twofold, was to help the, the interpret the science and technical information that was being generated pretty much every day at the site. And, and, and also to be on site during the construction or the cleanup of the landfill. And so um, when I first got the phone call at Love Canal, I was told that, oh, just come and look at the safety plan. And if you feel that it's, they're following the safety plan and they're doing all the things they said they would do, then you'll be done. Won't take more than two weeks. And so uh, when I arrived, the state New York, of New York had a different plan for me because they, they had a, a 50 day contract that uh, they wanted me to sign. And, and actually I worked for a consulting firm in Washington at that time. So I um, took it back to them and, and and then I was involved in this situation for two years. So um, one of the first things I learned at Love Canal was how much people understood about what was going on in their community. I learned more from talking to the people like Lois and other neighbors about what was going on in that community than I did from talking to the state health department people who were from Albany or some other part of the state and, and had come there and were just trying to evaluate what was going on. Uh, and this is something I've learned in communities across the country, uh, doing this for 40 plus years, that people are experts in their community. And one of the most important thing that somebody from outside the community can learn is to listen, is to go into these communities and listen to people, and then to develop and the testing and to develop the, the questions that you're trying to address through the science and through the, the, the development of primarily testing initially, is, is you need to take your lead from the community. It's not often done. It wasn't done easily at Love Canal without sometimes Lois and, and the community strangling these state health department people who didn't want to do anything unless they were forced. Uh, and that was something I quickly learned. So um, a quick question. I, now, this question is not going to work very well where I can't see people's hands being raised, but typically I would ask this question and, and ask people to answer, is information power true or false? And I would ask for a show of hands, uh, which I can't see, so I'm not going to do it. But um, uh, so, uh, and the reason I put this out there, we do this in, in some of the trainings we do, in many of the trainings we've done over the years, actually, is to help get people thinking, because the answer is false. Information is not power. That's the way we see it. And it's not because information isn't important. It is. But it's not the fact that you have a report and this great information that is going to change anything. It's what you do with it that makes the difference. It's whether, what your plan is for how you're going to educate people, how you're going to involve people, what you're going to do with it that makes all the difference in the world. And that's one of the lessons that I learned during Love Canal and, and, and share with groups across the country is it's what you do with information that gives you power, not the information itself. So um, I've, I've touched on a, a couple of these points here. Uh, the role of science in, in, in a situation like the Love Canal. And, 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 you know, I'm talking about this in many cases in the context of Love Canal, but all of this applies to today. All of this is relevant to communities that I've been working with for 40 years. And so it's still relevant. 
So, and I want to be clear about the science. I'm going to talk some about the limitations, but I want to be clear that the science is critically important. You can't win without the science. It's part of what you use to educate people about what's going on. It's part of the basis for your arguments. It's part of what you need to, to, to use to get government to change what they're trying to do. But you also need to understand the limitations in the information. Not in all information is equal. Not all information is a fact. And it's important to understand the difference between facts and opinions. So often people speak, scientists in particular, speak to the public and make statements as though these things were facts. Uh, and in fact, it's more an opinion. And so being able to distinguish between what's a scientist's opinion and what's an actual fact is important. And that's part of what we help people to do. And then there's this question of knowing when there's enough information to act. And that's, that's, that's a critical piece of this because given the many limitations, and I'll be addressing a number of those coming up, given the limitations in what we know and what we don't know about some of these, these the question, questions of how people are exposed to chemicals and, 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 what, and whether their health outcomes are related, there's huge uncertainties in that question. Uh, given that, when, is, when do you have enough information to act? So um, at CHEJ, we get, hundreds of phone calls uh, and, and nowadays they're emails, they don't come in as phone calls, but over the years we've gotten literally hundreds, thousands of phone calls from people who were just looking for the right information because they believed, as, as Lois did, she mentioned it earlier, that if we just got the right information in the hands of the right people, that they would do the right thing. This is how people get into this. This is what they th feel initially. They have a trust in government. Um, and, and unfortunately, and the reality is that that's just not how it happens. Um, it, it, it's, people are, people are, I mean, I wish I had a dollar for every community leader that called us over these years that, that, uh, that asked me this question and said, and they were looking for the magic fact. They were looking for some piece of information they, they believe was gonna be the difference be, and be the change maker in their situation. Uh, but it, it just doesn't work that way. There's no magic fact. There's no single piece of information that's going to change how a politician and how the decision makers are looking at the situation that people are facing. Um, and, and, and it's not because the people in government are evil or bad people or they have some agenda necessarily. It, it's because they turn to the scientist and say, well, are these health problems of the residents at Love Canal due to the landfill in the middle of the neighborhood? And it's not clear. There's no good answer for that. I mean, it's intuitively the right answer that yes, of course, how could these not be? How can this elephant in the room not be impacting these people's health? But from a science point of view, there's a lot not known and not a lot of the steps aren't clear. Uh, but it's not just the science. It's also the economics. Given these uncertainties and giving these questions about science, you have all these economic factors that come into play. If you're going to relocate people, who's going to pay for it? If you're gonna do the cleanup here, who's gonna pay for it? These are not monies that state governments typically have uh, uh, allocated in their budgets. And what about the liability? And once you start acknowledging that these people are being relocated or you have to clean up the site because of uh, the contamination here, you have, people, you have lawyers get involved. And, and if there's nothing that, that, that government hates more than providing the, the arguments for uh, communities to say that they're sick because of these con this contamination, and 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 uh, and then lawyers will get involved and there'll be lawsuits, and then you have the issue of the precedent. You know, what whatever decision you make here at any particular site that's in question, that becomes uh, the cleanup levels you selected at Love Canal become cleanup levels at communities across the state. If those are uh, those are are, are are the basis of why you you're relocating people, so you have the precedent issues. And so, um, so I learned this, and, and I want to tell a couple of stories from Love Canal that build on some of what you've already learned a little bit from, from Lois, but from a different perspective, from my perspective as a scientist. Um, at, Lois mentioned the, the health study that she did when she went door to door, gathered information, um, and, and that, was, um, that, was, that was a critical piece of information. And, uh, I worked with Bev Pagan, who was a, a scientist at Roswell Park in Buffalo. Um, 
and, and, and went with Bev to Albany to present the results of this study. This is Lois's study, her health study, that she had gone door to door and gathered information on. And we had this meeting with all the high level scientists at the health department in Albany, New York. We, we flew there in the morning, had our meeting, it lasted a couple of hours. We presented the results that the residents and had found. Uh, and, and, and we had what we perceived as a very good meeting. Um, they were listening to us. They were asking good questions. It was very collegial. There were really no hostility in the room. I mean, it, we left feeling that they had heard us. They were going to act and follow up on what we had just presented and that we, we felt pretty good about what was, what, what was going on. We arrived back in Buffalo later that afternoon. And, and at that point in history and time, uh, newspapers actually often published an evening paper. And that evening when we arrived at the airport in, in Buffalo, the, the papers uh, at the airport had in three inch block letters, the words useless housewife data. That's what the Albany and the health department was saying about the information that we had just presented to them. They essentially trashed it. They trashed our meeting. They trashed the, the homeowners. They trashed the whole concept that this could be possible. Uh, and, and we, of course, were stunned. We had no idea that this was coming. We had no understanding of why this had happened. Um, and, and Beverly immediately got on the phone and called Albany and said, what, what is this all about? And, and that was a, an important first step in understanding what was going on. Um, we didn't know this, but we later at the time, but we later learned that that press release that went to the Buffalo Papers had gone out before we had even begun our meeting. So they had decided in advance of our meeting that it was useless housewife data, that they didn't want anything to do with it. And, 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 and so I didn't at the time understand why. It took us another meeting, another community meeting for me to understand, and I'll share this story as well. Um, Lois talked about community meetings at, at Love Canal, and I'll share another photo of another meeting. These meetings were like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. Packed with 500 people easily, often in the, in the school auditorium, emotions raw as can be, people yelling at health officials, people crying. I mean, they, they were just an intense, intense meetings. And this was a couple of weeks uh, after the, the uh, meeting in Albany and, and the state health department people had come and they were presenting the results of new testing that had been done at the, at the, at the landfill. And, and so uh, it, it didn't go well. The meeting was very emotional, highly charged. And, and after the meeting, uh, I went back to Lois's house because that's what everybody from the community did. Her house was the central place for all the, the, the planning and post meeting planning and whatnot. And then um, I left there after a short while and, and went to the hotel room where I was staying. And, and uh, there's only one hotel in that part of Niagara Falls where the landfill was. So um, I, I, I was too charged up from the whole activity and meetings. And so I, I wasn't gonna sit in my room and then watch TV. So I went to the bar downstairs. And um, when I got there, um, all the state health department people who are also staying at the same hotel were there. So they invited me to join them. Now. At the time, I had been hired by the state of New York to be a advisor to the residents, but I was basically being paid by the state of New York. And, and, and it was clear to me in the, the month or so that I had been working there that they saw me as a buffer between the community, that they felt much more comfortable talking to me, a professional, than they did to the community who were um, uncontrollable, unreasonable, they felt, um, and, and, and irrational. And they had a few other choice words. Uh, but anyway, they invited me to join them, and I did, and I sat down, and they'd been there a little bit already, and they had a drink or two under their belt, and, 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 and what I then learned listening around the table was uh, a, another uh, level of education for me and, and learning about science, because what I heard was the Deputy Commissioner of Health of the State of New York, and this is not a small town public health agency, it's a, one of the, considered one of the best in the, in the United States, he was bragging about the fact that he, how well he had handled the meeting, how he didn't provide, provide answers to tough questions that were being asked by the residents. And, 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 and he just kept going on saying repeatedly, I didn't give him anything, I didn't give him anything. And that's when the light bulb went on in my head when I realized that, wow, 
It's not about the science. It's not about the information. They don't want to hear what Lois, the health information Lois had been collecting. They don't want to hear about uh, problems in the community. They have already decided they, that they needed to maintain control control of what we today call the narrative, control of the information, control of the, the, uh, the, the, the narrative uh, of what was going on. And they needed to reassure people, this is what they were attempting to do, that everything was under control, that they had the answers, when in fact they didn't. Because if they shared with the public the truth, if they shared with the, all the things they didn't understand about what was going on in this community and why so many people are sick and whether their health problems were, were due to the, the exposures to chemicals. And this was before they changed their strategy in response to Lois's, I think, change in her strategy. Uh, 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 and, they, and they did the study. So they, at this point, were not acknowledging anything that had, had, was going on at Love Canal. Uh, but they did... Um, so it, it, it was clear to me that maintaining control was the most important thing for the state health department. And, and that's what they were doing with the way they were presenting the information that they had. And so, um, so that was, um, so that, that's when I began to really understand that the science had such a small role in all of this. I mean, Lois summed it up at the end of her conversation by saying, you know, it wasn't about the science, it was about the politics. Um, okay. so. Um, in an ideal world, you know, government officials want scientists to be able to answer the questions they have in order to justify the decisions they make. They want, to, they want it in an ideal world to be based in sound science. We hear this all the time. Uh, today, we're, we're learning new elements of that because of this current administration. But, uh, but, uh, but when it comes to toxic chemicals, we actually have very few answers to the questions that people have about exposures to toxic chemicals. And, and this is because we know so little about toxic chemicals and the resulting exposures that, and these exa resulting health effects that, that occur as a result of exposure to combinations of chemicals over time. I mean, we know an enormous amount certain, about certain chemicals. I mean, take lead, for example, or dioxin, or mercury, and there's a whole lot of chemicals. We know an enormous amount of papers. There are thousands of papers on dioxin alone published every single year in the science literature. But when it comes down to the questions people ask in communities, not just at Love Canal, but time after time, uh, you know, we're working with a community in Houston today, in Ward 5, where they have uh, creosote exposure and PAHs that people are being exposed to. And, and they're asking the same questions 40 years later. And the questions are, are that, is, is the health, is my health problem, is the cancer I have, is the re respiratory problems I have, are they due to this chemical set I'm being exposed to? And scientifically, we can't answer that question, certainly not with any certainty. You know, and, and, and part of it is because we don't know much about exposure and what people are really exposed to, except for the snapshot in time we might have from one round of testing. We know very little about the body burden levels and what that means in terms of health outcomes. We know very little level about cumulative effects, not just cumulative in terms of over time, which is a, an important element, but cumulative in terms of, of multiple exposures at the same time to different chemicals. And so there's a whole lot of things that we just don't know. Now, given all of these uncertainties, this, these uncertainties have largely been used as an excuse not to take action, not for government not to do the things they need to do when people are being exposed. It took Lois changing her, I believe she changed her strategy. I'm not sure she thought of it in that context. And, 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 uh, and we can talk about this maybe perhaps in the Q&A. But uh, it, 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 because of the lack of certainty, it doesn't mean that government should act. They often choose not to, but it's, it should never be an excuse. And one of the things we help people, to we train people to do, we help them to understand, is that there is a point where you need, there's enough information to take action. We need to take action to protect people's health. The government needs to take action to protect people's health. And if they aren't gonna do it based on the science and they need to do it based on, on the outcry and the demands and, and the involvement of, a, of, of an impacted community. So let me just wrap up uh, with a few lessons learned and then we can open it for Q&A. Um, science is important, but it's not enough. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a critical piece of what people need to use, but by itself, it's not enough to win. 
the best scientific methods, I didn't really talk about this, but the best scientific methods don't provide the answers to questions people have about health problems. And that's something we've seen repeatedly, uh, whether it's an epidemiological study or a cancer registry of some time or another kind of registry. I mean, they, these, quite, these tools are not very good at answering questions people have in communities. Public health officials' prime responsibility is to maintain control and to reassure the public that everything's under control, even when it's not. And, 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 and if it's not, then people need, and you tell people the truth, then there are gonna be consequences. And those consequences are that people are gonna expect you to take action. They're gonna expect the government to act on what they know given what they don't know. And what we saw and what we've seen repeatedly is that combining science with advocacy is a game changer. It makes all the difference in the world if you have a plan on how you're gonna use science to move your, 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 your goals forward. And being strategic about how you use science and is part of that as well, is integrating that into the organizing work. And lastly, knowing when enough is enough and when, enough, when you have enough information to act. That makes all the difference as well. So let me stop there. Um, I can talk a lot more about a lot of this, but let me stop there and let's open it up to Q&A and bring Lois back on and others. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, so at this point, we have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to start with the first question? I will. We have a question from Diana Adams, which is about um, something Lois discussed, which is uh, the community across the street, which has been largely invisible in the historical narrative of Love Canal. And the question was asked, how was relocation for low income families handled? Very good question. Um, they received everything a rental family received on a homeowner side, the property owner side. So, so they were given um, a rent differential. So if they had to rent a place in a different place and the, the cost of it was higher, they would, that rental differential would be covered for a year. If the new place they were moving into um, did not have a refrigerator stove or other appliances, that also was given to them. Um, so it was about making them whole. The, uh, the, a lot of them wanted their children to finish, especially the high school students, to finish in the school that they were attending. So there was transportation provided for um, folks, both on the homeowner side and the, the rental side. To, to keep that going. So everything we received, they received, except for obviously the cost of the property. We were very clear. We worked side by side. I mean, literally nobody ever saw Sarah, um, but we asked for exactly the same thing and we, we both, both fought the same way. It is a sad thing though, that no one knows who Sarah is. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so we have another question here from Larry Roach, who has asked, he says, I've been involved in writing and reviewing human health risk assessments for 30 years. Um, US EPA and the states that I'm familiar with do not consider a person's value, relative contribution to society, race, socioeconomic status, etc. Are you aware of situations where this kind of cost benefit is occurring currently? Um, yeah, I can answer. I don't know if you have an example, Stephen, but um, it's, really, it's really not about the risk assessment per se. It's how it gets applied to decision making. So, so um, what goes into a risk assessment is all a bunch of factors, and, and that can vary one way or the other. But when you do a risk assessment and it says that you know, people are at risk, the, the, the cost benefit comes into play in the action and decision making. So based on that risk assessment risk number, um, do we move people or do we not move people? Do we clean up another two yards or do we not clean up another two yards? And then there, there, then there are these other subtle, so it's really more about the action decisions as opposed to the risk assessment itself. Um, there was a, I think it's Texar, Kansas, um, where they said, we're going to move people. And people said, well, you have, to, you have to buy our house at replacement value because it, of Jim Crow, because of redlining, whatever. Their houses were right next to the refinery. They, weren't, they, were, they were worth like $20,000. They couldn't buy another house for $20,000. Um, and they said, no, we're not going to move you then because the cost differential is so high that it's not cost effective for us. 
So, so there has been examples, but it's really not about the risk assessment per se. It's really about the action associated with the risk assessment. Do you have anything to add, Stephen? Um, not really. I mean, I, I, I agree that, that the numbers that you use to get your risk value is, is based on all these assumptions. And so, you know, what level of risk is acceptable is, is, a, term, is, a, is a factor in all of that. Um, but yeah, while they, that may not be part of the risk calculation, it's part of the risk management pay, uh, stage, which is the next level. Once you've got a risk number, then you would bring in risk management that bring in these cost, cost numbers. So we have another, we have another question from Rainer, Rainer Lohman, and I don't know which of you would like to answer this. The current super fund is not well funded Thoughts on how to change that? I think of New Bedford Harbor, which has been dredged for decades, but it's still not, quote unquote, clean. Yeah, super fun, super fun. We were gonna talk about super fun. Maybe we should just use this as a bridge. Um, and then we could go back into to Q and A. Um, super, fun, super fun is an extraordinary program. It is an extraordinary program. Um, and, and when it was passed, there were, there were a few things that people don't realize Superfund accomplished that I think is worthy of um, noting. Um, one is that because of the joint and several liability, meaning if any of your waste, you corporate A, B, or C, is found there, you have to pay a share of, of cleaning it up. Um, as a result of that, uh, the, the, the industry cleaned up their acts. They literally stopped creating all this toxic stuff. When, when, when the right to know got attached to, in 1986, to the Superfund legislation, um, where you could go and put your zip code in and find out what's being released, where the Superfund sites are, where RICWA sites are, where, where other things are, that, that changed so much about the way industry operated because people could see uh, and people could tell. So, so Superfund is not just about cleaning up dirt. The whole program itself was a huge incentive because prior to Superfund, industries would just, bad industries, not all industries obviously, uh, would open up the back of their, their tanker with all this waste water and, and just let it go down the side of the road as they drove away. The joint and several liability was, was really key to that. Um, I think the other real key uh, thing to, to Superfund is really the, there, inside it is a hammer and this hammer as we rephrase it, this hammer says that if you company A do not clean up your waste, then you have to, you, you have to, I, we, we can clean it up for you and then you have to pay triple damages. So that's huge, right? Nobody wants to pay triple damages. And so that hammer was a legal hammer, a liability hammer that was supposed to speed super fun forward and, and, and clean up things like the, like the New Bedford Harbor, Harbor and other places. Unfortunately, nobody used that hammer. And that, that was really unfortunate. Um, and it actually is being used recently now, uh, but for a long time, nobody used that hammer. The Superfund had their, the tax that was, that was put in there at the beginning uh, of the program in, in the 1980s. So the Superfund tax that they collected from chemicals that industry used, built a huge fund of money, which would have speeded up a lot of cleanups across the country. Except for in 1995, that tax expired. And as a result of that, Superfund doesn't have any money. So it's really hard to clean up sites when you don't have any money. What this administration is kind of interesting, um, is they did not, they did not um, renew the tax, which is unfortunate. But what they have done is they have decided, the Trump administration had decided to make Superfund its main program in, in the environment while they dismantle everything, everything else. Um, and that they were going to uh, make Superfund really, really move forward quickly. So what they ended up doing was finding low hanging fruit according to Administrator Pruitt when we met with him the first time. The low hanging fruit actually was using that triple damage hammer. 
So what this administration did is it went out to industries, to places like New Bedford, well, he didn't go to New Bedford, in, in Houston and St. Louis and other places like that. And um, he went to the industry and these places have been there for 10 years. He went to the industry and said, you need to clean this up. Uh, and if you do not clean it up, we are gonna sue you for triple damages. And, and the industry knew this administration didn't fool around like prior in administration, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, that this administration was really serious about this. And as a result, 54 sites have received some type of action, which is the largest number of sites under Superfund uh, in its history of the last 20 years. And, and these are, these are it, I mean, it was just amazing. And why you know, other administrators haven't done this, because I think it would have really changed where we are today. Um, I don't know, but they went to a place like Portland Harbor, and they said uh, there are 26 P PRPs, potential responsible parties. They decided there was 26 responsible parties. They, they um, rented an auditorium. They put the 26 company uh, people in there. I don't know whether they were the lawyers or the engineers or who they were, but the 26 uh, responsible parties in that room. And they said to them, EPA said to them, this is the cleanup plan. We are not negotiating for Portland Harbor. This is the cost, also not negotiable. And the 26 of you are going to figure out how to do this and who's going to pay what by September 30th and then they turned around and walked out of the room. And they gave them a, they actually gave them one month uh, extra and they did come up with a plan and now Portland Harbor is being cleaned up. So it's just like amazing. Some of these sites like Clark Fork River, like the, the you know, the Bedford Harbor, are, the, Harbor is not an easy cleanup. It's like, what do you do with that? And how do you do it? And it's dredging and dredging. The Housatonic is another one. Uh, the Hudson River is another one. So many of these have been contaminated for so many years, and it's gonna take decades upon decades upon decades to get it to a point where it's safe enough for people to do what, whatever it is they're choosing to do, whether that's fishing or swimming or, or using the water for, the, for purposes of drinking water. Um, they're just really hard to clean up. Not like, you know, there's other sites that are easier to clean up, but, but rivers, the harbors uh, are, are probably the, the hardest and it could be decades more before it's clean. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Stephen. Um, I'll just add that in addition, there are also these orphan sites that, um, that exist that don't have responsible parties that were not part of the Trump administration's focus for cleanup. And, and without funds for cleanup, without a budget, without uh, resources to, to clean these sites up, they will languish even longer. Uh, it's hard to get on the Superfund list. And if you don't have a deep pocket responsible party right now, then the chances of getting cleanup are, are, are really small because the EPA just doesn't have the money. The money is budgeted out of the general uh, EPA budget, mm -hmm. and that includes money for cleanup, and so it's just it's just not there. Yeah, and uh, we have I have this. Let me see. This is uh, I was going to show you something, but I guess I can't find it. <laughs> so never mind. Um, yeah, so, so the, other, the other problem, the realistic problem, is that Democrats and Republican, both parties, create so much havoc. I mean, it, it's no different than Love Canal. It's, it's, all about, <laughs> it's all about politics. So while Trump was moving forward on doing um, these various, you know, PRP, responsible party, hammer, getting people uh, to, to pay attention. Um, I was working with Cory Booker, Blumenauer, a number of the Democrats who have historically uh, put on, on the docket in the House and the Senate uh, the Superfund polluter pays fee tax. And so I suggested, and, and some of our folks uh, suggested that now is the time to push this through because this is Trump's thing and he really wants to do this. I don't know about the polluter pay tax, but he really wants to do something with Superfund. And so if we could push this through, if somebody would push this through, uh, I, 
you know, the House and the Senate, I, I think Trump would sign it. The answer to that was, we're not giving Trump a win. That's just disgusting. It's like, really? I mean, we have people like in Minden, West Virginia, who was an uh, orphan site of Stephen Remark, who is sitting there. I mean, every, every, single, every single neighbor has cancer in their house. They have no hope of getting out of there. They have no hope of cleaning up. It is a orphan site. Schaefer Chemical, who made PCBs, which is a contaminant, um, is out of business, been out of business for decades. How, how are they going to get any help? How are they going to get any relief? And, you know, that's just one of many of these orphan sites that are just left there. And so politics, I mean, you know, we, it would be really nice if we lived in a world where it was just like straight and it's either good or bad or yes or no. But the politics of Superfund is just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. And, and I was, I can't tell you, I walked out of that, that um, Senate building with my staff and we were, we were literally in tears. It's like, these are human lives at risk. These, this is not about politics. This is not, I mean, I, yes it is, but it's not. It's about men and women and little babies and communities and they can't just be ignored. It's just not right. So, I, I apologize, shall I couldn't we, find this. Shall, oh, here it shall, is. We, uh, shall we move to a couple of questions? Sure. And there's... So one question I, I, I'd like to ask you is related to Love Canal, for example, or any other super fun site you've had mm -hmm. in a relationship with, what do you know about long-term studies to see lifelong impacts? How, how long did any kind of evaluation of um, adverse health impacts continue with Love Canal? Well, we, um, it was an interesting, <laughs> Love Canal was interesting because one of the questions that's, that um, the commissioner of New York State Health, um, Dr. Freed, when he was there, uh, wanted to find out is whether the Love Canal residents were exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals. And the way to determine that is three generations because you had to get the generation that wasn't exposed either in utero or uh, uh, as a child or an adult. And so there was a second study that was done on Love Canal uh, and it was looking at our children and our children's children because we're now old people and our children had children. <laughs> and um, what they found was that our children had children born with birth defect rates at the same amount as we did. So percentage-wise of how many births, that 50% or more of the, our Love Canal children's children had birth defects. They also found a high rate of um, heart disease, which we found it with Dr. Pagan as well, and a number of other outcomes, which we found with Dr. Pagan. And so that was an interesting study. What, what was interesting about it is that they the New York State Health Department released it and said, we didn't find any problem here. <laughs> and then, and then I couldn't figure out, like, how could you say that when the statistics say that this is this? And in any case, so, so he wanted to look to see if we did another study on the Love Canal's children's children, uh, and we might be able to, to discover whether or not there, would, there is an endocrine disrupting uh, impact. Um, but New York State has now decided they're not going to do any more follow-up studies. And so they're not keeping the database up to date, you know, following people and so forth. So I think that is the last study, which is, a, you know, both sad um, and also a little nerve wracking because we really would like to know that for not just the Love Canal families, but for other communities across the country. I mean, the, the, the other thing I would add to this is that one of the things the residents wanted to do, so when we were moved in 1980, uh, all the families could leave if they so chose, we wanted it, the scientists, and we weren't really sure what we meant by scientists, but we wanted them to use Love Canal as a study area. What happens to the, the field mice? What happens to the squirrels? What happens to uh, families, you know, in the long term? 
mental health, uh, what happens to families in not just reproductive, but what happens to them in other diseases? Do they become more immune depressed? I mean, what happens? And that never happened. I think we could have learned so much from Love Canal back then if we really looked at it as an opportunity as opposed to um, a political threat. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things that strikes me about it is that, you know, when you gave us the uh, quote, uh, the, the, the statement that was made, that it was a random clustering of genetically defective people, uh, mm -hmm. that, that smacks of eugenics. I mean, that's really horrifying. Uh, so, you know, that's why I was particularly interested in the long-term study. Elizabeth, can you jump in with your question? Yeah, I, I, have, a, I, have, to, I have to ask a, recovering, a question from a recovering politician to start. <laughs> um, They're not all bad. Some of you guys no. are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but actually, it's, it's related. And that is, um, do you see other leaders coming out of the experience of having lived through uh, a super fund, a, a environmental disaster like, or perhaps have coming from somewhere else who are taking on this challenge nationally, um, in addition to CHEJ and the two of you. Yeah, actually, what what, what CH I didn't speak much about CHEJ. Um, what CHEJ does is try to build those folks. So we get a lot of people who come to us from various, they're fighting an incinerator or have a super fund, whatever it might be. And we try to not only train them how to be better advocates for what they're looking to achieve, but we also try to connect them with other peoples and build a larger organization. This is not a national fight. This is a, a fight that has to be local and grow nationally. That's how we, we see it. And so, for example, we, we work with Jackie Young, and she's from Houston, and she is at a super fun site there, the Waste Pits. And um, so Jackie said, I want to do more than just the Waste Pits. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? And she says, I want to start this organization. So she went from this local leader like the Lois Gibbs, and she now has a whole Houston area. She's working with seven other community groups there who are really you know, struggling to find answers for their pollution. One is Union Pacific, one is something else, and uh, a solid waste incinerator that's there and people below it and refineries. And, um, and so there, there are a lot of those and that's what we're trying to do. Um, my, my whole role in coming to DC after um, Love Canal was to set up the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice to help other people, but, but not to build an empire um, but rather to create a spider web of hubs where people connect with people and they learn from each other and they build that base from the bottom up so that, you know, irregardless of what happens in DC, you know, your, your most power is local and then second the closest power is state. And, and that's where people can really, you know, move things forward. So, so yeah, so we've worked with over 10,000 groups over, uh, our, our life. Um, and we have, I would say, 300, 350 of those, what we call larger than locals. So they're not a local group. They're not necessarily a state group. They're not an original group, although they can be. They're just larger than what brought them to the table to begin with. And we connect them all. They have so much in common. Thank you. So I have a, I have a second question, Stephen, for you. And that is about scientific expertise. And is there, are there still areas where we need to know and communicate, well, first of all, to know better expertise that we need to develop, particularly around human health impacts? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think that that's one of the areas that we can't answer for people. I mean, um, we, don't, we, we need to develop an understanding of what it means when people are exposed to mixtures of chemicals. I mean, most of what we do as, as scientists in the lab is study one chemical at a time. We're breaking out of that a little bit more in these last five years or so, 10 years maybe. But historically, we've looked at one chemical at a time and, and, and our knowledge is very narrow in the understanding of these chemicals and their mechanism of action and how they affect people. So yes, there's a lot more we need to understand to be able to answer people's fundamental questions. And, and I mentioned it earlier. I mean, it's, it's the basic question is, you know, are my health problems related to this, this landfill or this emissions from this facility? 
and, and, and we can't give good answers to that. We can quantify risks and we can quantify, um, you know, different types of risks, but, but basically we can't answer that question very well for people. And so that's very frustrating. And, and from 40 years later from Love Canal, we couldn't do it then and we still can't do it today. And I, and I personally think that NIEHS or NIH, somebody at that level needs to make a commitment that we're gonna try to get at this problem. We're gonna really learn and, and devote billions of dollars, kind of like a, you know, the race to the moon kind of thing, you know, when Kennedy said, we're going to beat the Russians to the moon and all these <laughs> dollars went into, <laughs> went into that program. I mean, we need something like that to be able to really get at these questions and be able to answer for people why they're sick and, 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 and how it may or may not be related to the chemicals that they're breathing or they're in the soil or they're in their drinking water. Yeah. And, so, and fundamentally, one of the problems is, is the way we investigate it. Uh, we, we have started a new project at CHEJ called Unequal Response, Unequal Protection. So, so one of the things when, when we think about foodborne uh, problems, right? You have the, the Food and Drug Administration, CDC, they're just like all over it. You have commercials on TV, you know, where we're calling, we're, we're, we're recalling, you know, romaine lettuce or tomatoes or, you know, Chipotle's at it again. You know, you don't eat there, don't eat their lettuce, whatever it is. Uh, and there's this big response, right? And then it's also true in um, uh, infectious disease. So, you know, one person gets measles. We won't talk about COVID because that one is just crazy. But, you know, one, one or two people get measles. The, there's a whole team of people at CDC who drop what they do every day. And they go and they figure out who, where is patient zero? Where did they go? Track, you know, tracking all of that stuff. And then there's like, all these commercials, get your, get your measles vaccination for your children, da, 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 da. Then when you, you come to a place like Love Canal and you say, okay, we, or any, you know, a number of other places, but you, you have over half the babies born with birth defects. Shouldn't that ring a bell? And then somebody come in and investigate it. Not, you know, in the same way that a team is set up right now, for example, if you're looking at birth defects at Love Canal, or if you're looking in Birmingham, Alabama, around the Coke facility, what's happening there, the, the health risk assessors, whether it's the state or the federal government through EPA, they are using soil data and environmental data that is intended to determine the extent of the problem. You use different chemicals to determine the extent of the problem. Tracer chemicals, they travel faster through the air or better through the air or better through the soil or the water. I, I don't know, the scientists know this stuff. I don't know this stuff, but, but they're tracer chemicals. And that's what they look for because that makes sense to try and figure out how far did this spread under the ground or how far is this spreading in the air? It makes perfect sense. But that same data is not data you would use to assess human health, yet they do. Right? So this data, at, you know, it's the wrong chemical often. Uh, it's the wrong level of detection often. And then you have the city, and then you have the state, and then you have the federal government. They all take different samples. They all take it at different levels, different methodology. You can't put one next to the other next to the other and accumulatively say because they're not the same. They're not taken the same way. They're not having the same level of detection. They don't have the same chemicals. They don't have the same depth. They don't have, it, it's insane the way that they really look at environmental health. It is not seriously being looked at at all. They look at the levels that they're checking in the dirt and the water for the purpose of, do we need to clean up? How do we need to clean up? And how far do we need to clean up? And then they take all of that media data and they apply it to human health, which is just stupid. And, and so, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we do a, what would a team look like that we could put under Superfund or um, ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Disease Substance Registry, <laughs> um, that, that their, their whole thing is when you have a problem like Love Canal or Birmingham, Alabama or New Bedford Harbor or whatever it is, that this team actually comes in and they have a protocol, they have a timeline, they have some money, they, they're, they're coordinating the sampling so that they can be compared to one another and used as a whole as opposed to scattered all over the place. And you know that 
I think that's a first step. That's not the answer, but it's a first step to move us forward to really take these situations seriously, especially because in most of the communities that we're working in, and this is happening, they're low income communities. They're black and brown people. They're people who don't have health care. They're healthcare deserts, they're food deserts, you know, and, and you know, they're the most vulnerable amongst us. And, and, you know, we need to really approach it holistically and say, yeah, we, we can do this. Well, I think we are, we're uh, unfortunately about at time now, but I'd like to just say a couple of things really quickly, which is that um, it was interesting when we had a chance to talk with you before we set, when we were setting up this uh, event, uh, we had some conversation in which uh, both of you said uh, that you thought it was extraordinarily important when you were working with communities that you not come in and speak as the experts, that you come in and train them to become experts. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think that is a profoundly important point that you make and one that I wanted to be sure people, if they didn't extrapolate it from what you said today, I want to make sure it's out loud and clear because I think it's a, it's a brilliant strategy um, and a way to spread the, uh, just, just, because certainly, you know, we see the passion that you had in, at Love Canal because it was, it was your children, it was your life, you know, and none of us, we may have some expertise to bring, but we, we don't necessarily have that as well. You have you two both, having lived through the Love Canal situation, are aware of, at the gut level, what this means and what it is. So I, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Um, you you really I think provided us with a wonderful oversight, um, and I know that there are people who are sitting saying, well, you know, to have that kind of drive and that kind of uh, passion and commitment. Uh, and strength to do this, uh, it, it, you, it's true, you do have that. On the other hand, I think a lot of people have it if they're allowed to just given enough support to find it. Yes. Um, and that's one of the things that you're doing with CHEJ and I think it's a, a fantastic thing. So I wanna thank you both so much for being here and for the extraordinary actions you've taken toward addressing and continuing to address the heinous and, and reprehensible actions that uh, responsible parties on a daily basis do with, uh, you know, very, very little attention to the impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also like to formally acknowledge Sarah Herbert as somebody who was sidelined as a renter and as a black woman, as a vulnerable member of the community uh, for the work that you so rightly have recognized her for doing. Um, it's, it's, we see it in many movements where black women are sidelined, you know, or, or, or black people in general are sidelined uh, from their, their roles. Um, I also want to thank you, Elizabeth, for being with us today and for sharing this event with us. And we're, we're so happy to have um, the, uh, the companion support uh, that we can provide to each other as we go forward. And um, Lois and, and, and Stephen, uh, you're, you're now on the hook with us, so we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to bug you from time to time, but we look forward to working um, with you on some things. Uh, and I also want to thank my colleagues, Amber Neville, Nate Vinataro, and Hannah Klinger, uh, and to all of you today here in the audience, those of you who hung in for the, for the whole <laughs> ride, thanks so much. And uh, this talk today will be on the Coastal Institute's YouTube page. So thanks again for allowing us to do that. Uh, Lois and Stephen, we really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. It was it was a it was terrifically informative and also I think in energizing for all of us. Oh, great. Thanks. Well, thank you, thank you, and you know we're around if you if you or any of your students or participants are interested in following up because we we dumped a lot. <laughs> we're happy to spend some time with them to talk it through. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.